So it is a great pleasure to welcome Professor J. Richard Bond, Dick Bond, as we all know him, uh, to UCSD to come to a place that's finally as cold as Toronto is today. Uh, quite chilly here in San Diego, but it's uh, always nice and a ray of sunshine whenever Dick is around. I've known Dick since I was a young postdoc in Andrew Lang's lab at Caltech in 2001. We first met. Uh, after uh, Dick gave his lecture, which is an informal lecture, I remember Andrew saying that was a lecture that only Dick Bond could give because it was a lecture only Dick Bond understood. It was phenomenal. <laughs> and uh, Andrew, and I know you guys had a wonderful relationship. It's great to be, uh, to be able to host him. He's been here for about a week. I think he's here for another week doing work with us. He's a renowned cosmologist, uh, has won innumerable prizes and awards, too lengthy to mention the Gruber Prize, recently the Heinemann Prize. Uh, <clears throat> he's a uh, Royal Mounted Policeman. Now, you're a fellow of the Royal Canadian Red Dead. The Royal Society of Canada uh, equivalent, and um, and we're actually distant cousins. So this plaque was made by one of my recent graduate students, who is a professor in New Mexico, Darcy Barron. She made a plaque on the occasion of her graduation, and it traces my chain of PhD genealogy all the way back to Friedrich Leibniz, who was not the famous Leibniz, another Leibniz, <laughs> but, along, <laughs> but along the way there's a bifurcation that is going through Charles Lauritsen, ah, who nice. was the PhD advisor of, and the, grand P, the PhD advisor of Willie Fowler, who was Dick's PhD advisor, and our very own George Fuller, who's in the back. So I think we're like, you know, 164th related or something like that. <laughs> um, but it's a real pleasure to have you here. We're looking forward to an informal conversation on the state of cosmology, the state of the universe, as seen through the eyes of Dick Bond. Thank you, Dick. Great. You know, I saw that, and I said, I would really like to get something like that, but it's pretty good. So, George, how are we going to... We got Lauritsen, but how far back could we go? My question on that plaque and that, that genealogy is whether Millikan was really Lauritsen's advisor. Mm. It's possible, but in a formal sense he was, because Lauritsen actually got a PhD in electrical engineering in Denmark. So maybe, maybe, you know, Millikan brought him on shelves somewhere. <laughs> okay, anyway, I shall begin. Um, and the deal with Brian was that I would have basically do no work for this talk because, <laughs> because uh, we are doing fundamental things on not the boring old CMB, but on the cosmic neutrino background with George. And people will be coming in next week to further work with us. So the other big theme that we have going is modern inflation with uh, Dan, Raphael, uh, Jonathan Braden, who's a postdoc uh, at CETA uh, with me. He's part of this general collaboration. And so uh, those are the things that are sort of dominating our minds. Um, this is going to be an embarrassingly, um, hopefully not so opaque, uh, rendition of a uh, basically a public lecture. I've uh, done versions of it for different audiences. One was at IPMU in Japan, and so that was a somewhat more sophisticated audience. Then there was a, a big summer school that was held in India, and um, I injected the odd one of those slides just for amusement and to see Dan and, and Raphael um, drop their, uh, their chins in an agape fashion at how silly I can be. Uh, and then I gave it uh, at Penn State. They were having a, a, a celebration of uh, Ashtakar's center, some anniversary of it. I was in good company. There was Jocelyn uh, Bell Burnell, or Burnell Bell, or whatever it is, uh, Jocelyn Burnell, who you all know about pulsars. And then uh, immediately after me was uh, Barry Barish, and so they had a low point, which was my <laughs> presentation. And uh, one of the things I like to do in giving talks like this, apart from uh, talking about a little bit about history and how where we are now and where we're going, is to try and stretch minds a bit with the ideas, because why are we in this subject? I mean, maybe you just love your amplifiers or whatever, but uh, 
It's really the big questions which has drawn us all into the cosmology area. And yes, we all have to work in detail on teams in order to make the great developments, but nonetheless, um, uh, we should always bear in mind how profound the questions we are asking. And Mother Nature is not always uh, forthgiving, but we just keep knocking on her door and she'll tell us in the end. So anyway, with all that little background, um, here's the sort of thing that uh, I was saying then and I'm saying now. From complexity to simplicity to complexity to simplicity is the universe at large. Complexity at the beginning being what is the initial state of the universe. And um, when we add quantum mechanics, and we'll see that quantum mechanics is a bit of a theme here, the natural consequence is that there is a phenomenon which is at the heart of quantum mechanics it's called quantum diffusion. And that can lead, well, to an idea called eternal inflation. But what it can lead to is, if you think about non-Gaussianity, where we're trying to place these little constraints on non-Gaussianity now, the universe at large, according to just adding your basic h-bar, is likely to be incredibly complex on ultra-large scales, but scales that we cannot address because they're beyond our horizon. So then we come to simplicity. And the ridiculous thing is that we actually believe we can make sensible statements about the universe at some time shortly after 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Now let us remember that 10 to the minus 44 seconds is not after time zero. It is just some number because I would say the current view of cosmology, or at least my view, and therefore it's the current view, um, <laughs> is that there is no time zero. There is no Big Bang. There is emergence, one way or another, from presumably a very long-lived state. And where we actually really start to count things is either from when matter got created, that's the end of inflation, or maybe from when there was an emergence from a high degree of quantum fluctuations into something that looked somewhat classical. Anyway, so you can see one of the ideas here is to get pretty philosophical on you so that you get, I mean, it's Friday afternoon, there's beer after, we can get a little trippy. Um, to complexity, well, it's not really that complex, but what it is is the world under gravitational instability. Uh, and that creates the cosmic web and everything within it. What an outrageous thing to say, but that's all fits together, right? Then to simplicity, which is maybe or maybe not our asymptotic future, which is uh, a cosmological constant dominated. Uh, the people that will tell you that there is no question it's lambda. I think that's crazy. Not because it might not be or might not appear to be. It's just, it just doesn't fit in to an asymptotic story. Okay, then I have a little aphorism there that aren't we audacious in terms of our ability to think that we can understand all of this stuff when all we get is this little bit of information in this tiny little sub-packet of the universe at large. Okay, so now I will get to, because I am going to give you some CMB past, CMB present, because uh, that's what most of the people are into here. You know that we're characterizing the universe in terms of basically seven plus numbers, three densities, baryons, dark matter, dark energy, and then two plus one early universe inflation parameters. The plus one is not really a plus one, it is the gravitational wave content as measured by the tensor to scalar ratio. Hopefully there will be a plus one at some point, but there are two, amplitude, slope, and why two, right? Why not a lot more? Well, we might hope there's more. Anyway, the past into present, I'll describe a little bit of this. Future. What we are interested in, it's actually what we were interested in here all along, 
was to go beyond the standard model of cosmology to beyond the standard model of cosmology, that is to say, learn more than just the seven number tale that we are fond of telling. Uh, so that's beyond the standard model. So what I was trying to do with the Penn State group, which was uh, the least scientifically sophisticated, was to try and, uh, first of all, explain to them the CMB baby pictures, and then try and get their minds fertile enough to understand the even earlier embryo pictures of the early universe that we can make based upon mainly the microwave background uh, data. And so that's sort of even the goal here because um, they're some of my favorite figures. But then in this discussion, I said it's actually a tale of Planck times four. So Planck is the Planck satellite, and it helped decode the role, of, as did other experiments, the role of Planck's quantum, h-bar, uh, and the emergence of our universe from the Planck era, characterized by the Planck mass times c squared, which has, of course, an h-bar in it, as well as uh, 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 Newton's uh, gravitational constant. And one of the ways that manifests itself, and this is extremely important, is that it's working through uh, quantum diffusion. And that's the fourth name of Planck in this story, the Fokker-Planck equation, which turns out to be a description of how the fields evolve probabilistically through the inflationary realm. And a characteristic scale, this is a diffusion constant, square root of it, it goes like h-bar times the Hubble parameter, the expansion parameter, which is the Hawking temperature. And it might seem kind of strange that something like a Hawking temperature would actually be of importance. It's also uh, got, I think it may even have a Gibbons name associated with it, certainly with the entropy. But that turns out to, that is the scale that really matters. And it is like a diffusion process which is occurring, which is ultimately, according to our uh, gospel, that is what creates all of the structure that we see around us in the universe. It is that quantum diffusion process. That is to say, it isn't just gravity operating, it's h-bar. Uh, goes without saying. Okay, now let's go back to CMB at 50, I'll show this again, but this was a great gathering uh, because it was celebrating Alpha G Gamov and Herman. Uh, uh, no, sorry, it was actually uh, celebrating uh, 50 years after uh, Penzias and Wilson. Uh, I give pride of place to Gamov on this. Um, my Princeton friends, not so much. Um, I don't know why. Um, and you know the history, right? Dipole in the 70s. Uh, an event which I'll come back to, which was quite influential, so I was really pretty proud of playing a big role. It was the first time that theory and experiment as a community got together. It was called the Delta T over T meeting, Toronto, right? T, Britain, um, in 1987. And it really sort of, in some respects, helped to set the stage for what was to come. And the thing that is actually quite amazing is that more or less the theoretical landscape was, uh, was pretty well in place at, uh, by that time. It doesn't mean that there haven't been huge advances. It just means the basic outlines were there, although things could have gone in many different directions. Kobe launch 89, announcing the black body. Let us remember Herb Gush at UBC who did it simultaneously. And isotropies um, with Kobe, but simultaneously with a few other experiments. So Kobe gets pride of place, but in fact, from my perspective, I knew about fluctuations that were there in two other experiments, one of which was called uh, it used to be called the MIT balloon experiment. 
Um, and I saw Trapeze Boomerang played a big role. There were obviously many things before it. Uh, WMAP launched in 2001, polarization revealed around 2002, Daisy First, CBI, Boomerang Quad. Uh, Plank launched 2009. We have just realized on, believe it or not, I'm still on Plank editorial board telecon today, that we have a 10 year anniversary coming around May 14, 15 of that launch. Uh, Okay, you know all of that game, ACT, SBT, Polar Bear, uh, everything, Bicep Keck. Uh, okay, <laughs> there's a little comment here, but I will not presume to try and scoop your book, Brian. <laughs> uh, and then what is our future? We know what our future is, and it's glorious, really. Uh, stage three now. Uh, Simon's Observatory, rah, rah, we, we expect in November, unless NASA doesn't work for us, uh, a launch of Spider 2, CMB Stage 4. Problem there is that it's probably 2025-ish, and um, I won't be as young as I am now in 2025. <laughs> Lightbird, we're looking at Canadian involvement, Japanese satellite, uh, 2028 probably the earliest launch, and knowing the history of launches. And so, once again, okay, I'm gonna take a look at some of these people later. So we'll come back to that picture. It was just a great gathering. And, uh, okay, so now, now I'm going to embarrass you or embarrass myself by showing how I lead into this. Because, you know, when you're giving a public talk, you have to explain the ATOF or hammer, whatever projection you're, and that takes a little bit of work, right? But you look at the Earth in this projection and everybody's got immediate recognition. But that's not actually the reason I showed it. And then, you know, oh, dark matter, how happy we are about that. Oh, did I go back? Yeah, okay, this I will spend a moment or two on. Uh, and it isn't the deepest look into the universe, not at all, but it was an amazing tour de force the observational emergence of the cosmic web, uh, starting with a few observations of the region around the Comus uh, cluster, really some of the first indications of uh, superclustering. Um, Virgo cluster, of course, we knew about. And then this started to fill in as the 80s developed. But as I was uh, describing, maybe it was over lunch, or maybe it was someplace else, I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, people didn't believe in these things. The Russians really believed in it because they had a theory and people had another theory. But anyway, the bottom line is that uh, the superclustering is fundamental to the cosmic web. And the other aspect of the cosmic web is that it's a natural outgrowth of Gaussian random adiabatic field under gravitational instability, and the key elements on large scales are clusters, superclustering, voids, filaments, and, uh, and then this, of course, is the zone of avoidance, uh, rotated from the other one. Um, but we used to give every one of these things names, and they were, you know, it's almost like they were intimate friends of mine as they emerged over time. But then the interconnectivity and the sheer volume of the surveys we've been dealing with in large-scale structure are such that uh, only the most amazing things will get a name now. They're just some kind of coordinates up there on the sky because everything is interconnected. It is one manifestation of a field under gravitational instability. And so, of course, that is only looking at, and so I'm going to use the language of E-foldings as our measure of uh, look-back time. It's only 0.1 of an E-folding back, this region here with all of this fantastic structure. And I'm introducing that uh, because we're going to work our way back. To, these are things that you know really well, but you may not know the way that I will always talk about this stuff. Um, Okay, so alpha is ln A. This is a mean value, and we're going to make this inhomogeneous in a few minutes. 
Uh, the photons, you know all about that. Uh, but it's kind of fun to just say what are the epochs in terms of number of e-foldings. So the light CMB was released at uh, seven e-foldings. Uh, galaxies were formed between about one or two e-foldings, most of them anyway. There were no galaxies at three old e-foldings ago. Uh, light nuclei, maybe dark matter, emerged between 21 and 35 e-foldings. Heat, radiation, and entropy got generated at 67 e-foldings. An interesting question, and George and I are anthropocists, so um, you've probably been inundated with George waxing eloquent about entropy. The idea is that at 67, that's when essentially all of the entropy, it could change forms, but essentially all of the entropy in the universe. It's not necessary. There could have been dramatic phase transitions of first order that could have created entropy subsequently. But um, this was the big event. That's the end of inflation. And then over the observable range of E foldings from 67 to 127 is um, the observable range of E foldings associated with the inflationary period that we could uh, access with our observations. But we have done calculations in which you can put another one or so in front of these. It's sort of eternal inflation. In other words, the universe could have many, 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 many E foldings beyond anything that we can see. And that is, in fact, according to me, it's the standard model. Okay, so um, here's some content. You know all about it. Uh, I, I'm going to fool around with an idea here. Uh, instead of thinking of GIJ for uh, gravity, it's interesting just to think of uh, the scale tensor of the universe. Instead of scale, it becomes uh, something that depends upon position and time and it has tensor components, and so you get the relationship between position and some equilibrium unperturbed position, all described by uh, expansion, uh, a scale expansion factor, which has an exponential, and uh, the deviation of this from the mean law in A, which I talked about before, is something which is a strain tensor. And so strain is going to be a terminology which I will use quite a bit in describing the deformations associated with gravity. So from this form, the velocity, and this is completely general, is related to the instantaneous position, the dx's, by the Hubble parameter, which is now a tensor, and position dependent, and it's in fact a shear tensor. So fundamental aspects of the universe are strain, shear, and what is even more important at some level is the derivative of the shear, the acceleration of the strain, because that's like a tide. That's like what gravity is operating on. Okay, so I did that because I think of yourself as a general audience. And I'm going to try and give an analogy of things that people viscerally feel, and uh, maybe not so much here in Southern California, but certainly around LA and somewhat higher. They have a visceral feel for the power of Mother Nature expressing itself in earthquakes. And so uh, that's an elastic deformation, which uh, leads to strain, which has an isotropic component the trace of the uh, strain tensor, uh, which is <coughs> the ordinary sound. But there are shear waves as well with the anisotropic strain. And so we're all kind of used to that, even at the point of having uh, rock and roll to it. Uh, but the universe is also under continuous strain. Uh, and um, the gravity waves from black hole collisions have of course, gotten a lot of attention. Those are like space quakes, and it really has got a lot of similarity to that. And of course, gravity waves are a consequence, 
Uh, there is deformation of the geometry. Uh, there is anisotropic strain, the transverse traceless is the gravity waves. And m from our point of view here, there's isotropic strain. And the isotropic strain is like sound, and it is like sound. And um, the story of what I'm trying to get you to here today is a picture of sound, not the sound of the baryon acoustic oscillations that you're used to from the CMB, but the sound in the ultra early universe, which is energy density fluctuations, which are manifesting themselves sound. Uh, if the linear regime strain is proportional to tide, that's the intimate way of trying to understand how the cosmic web develops. So now, again, this was for a general audience because you have to try and explain redshifting. How do you explain redshifting? Well. You know, some people, they, uh, they sort of walk away quickly and make some statement and they say, remember Doppler? <laughs> but here is something that you're used to dealing with, but maybe you don't. The question is, does one feel it viscerally? Because we're used to the concept of co-moving. Co-moving scales. We're used to light stretching. What is actually happening, and it's, you'll just say, of course it's true, but light and gravity are entangled. They are entangled in such a way that you don't split them apart. That is the stretch. The stretch is there. It's universal. I've had uh, battles with my very good friend, uh, Nick Kaiser, who says, no, that's all fantasy. It's all just a galaxy here letting out a photon, and then you measure it here without the concept of having a dynamical situation where gravity is entangled with the light to obviously do the bending that we're used to, but the redshifting as well. Anyway, this little fact, which you're so used to, is actually an amazing phenomenon that's occurring. And um, if you go to extremely high energies, you can break this. Uh, inflation theory is the theory of the vacuum under deformation, under deformation by strain. I like to think of it in terms of a condensate which develops, that's not a usual way of looking at it, plus quantum fluctuations and what we just had a very long conversation about ongoing for generations and generations, but today uh, with Jonathan and, and uh, with Dan about, you know, the nature of quantum fluctuations on the really smallest scales and how do you deal with quantum fluctuations where, as you probably know, there's a half h bar omega problem. That is to say, it looks like there is an energy density which is far beyond any energy density that we measure, like m Planck to the fourth or something. Those are the zero-point oscillations that would be there in Minkowski space. Somehow, under gravity, it knows to rub those out and take the difference. And so that's one of the remarkable things. And it turns out that if we don't deal with this in our calculations, we'll get the wrong answer. So there's much still to be done here. There's a lot of similarity between the inflationary theory and Hawking's black hole evaporation. It's also associated with the vacuum deformation under strain. The vacuum deformation there is the strong gravity that wraps itself basically around uh, a mass concentration. And that concentration is like a condensate. And within it, there are all these quantum fluctuations that as the black hole shrinks, the quantum fluctuations can escape, and that's black hole evaporation. The escaping of the quantum fluctuations in inflation hit theory, that's the large scale structure of the universe. It's an amazing thing. I'm saying things that you probably all know, but it's good to say them again, because sometimes we, in our detailed work, 
we lose the sense of mystery of what it is we're actually dealing with. Oops. Yeah, okay. So I'm going back now to some CMB stuff, which I'll probably be able to go through pretty quickly. I put circles around not important people, but <laughs> many important people. What I didn't get a chance to do, to my chagrin, is that I didn't do a scan for, um, uh, for my UCSD friends. So where are you here? Next to oh, you're right, you're right. pointed at me right there. Yeah. Next to Joe. Well, yeah. Where are you? Where are you, Brian? I'm next to Joe. Right to the left of Joe Dunkel. Right oh, well, that's an auspicious place to be, right? right. right. Uh, were you there, Raphael? Yeah, I'm somewhere <laughs> up next to the, the C circles on the right side and to the left of your left. Yes. Yeah. You covered his face. Have, I, his have I annihilated <laughs> you? Oh, well, it's okay. Theorists can be annihilated. <laughs> we can just create no, new no, ones. Okay, I don't have it. Right but you all know what he looks like. Just look at him. <laughs> you weren't there, no. Anyway, you can see that this was, and I call it a family gathering, because it brought people from such a long time ago. This is, uh, uh, that's Penzias, I think, yes? That's Bob Wilson. Say it again? No, that's Wilson. That's Wilson, yeah, Penzias wasn't there. Penzias wasn't there, right. There's Peebles. But uh, what I've mainly done is to put a few circles around some PIs, and therefore I should have put it around my uh, Brian. Uh, that's Carlstrom. That's uh, Bill Jones. This, not a good picture of him, but we actually put it on a spider launch. That's Andrew Lang, one of the great spirits of the subject. So sad that he's not with us. Um, Peebles, uh, Lyman Page, John Kovac. Uh, this is one of the pictures, that, apart from this interloper, it's a rather famous picture in the subject of the CMB because um, we were down for the WMAP launch in 2001, and uh, I went off with um, Sinyaev, and uh, we ran into my good friend Dave Wilkinson, and had the wisdom to take this picture. Sinyaev was just so happy and excited, because behind us here is a Saturn V rocket, and it was one of the great rockets, and he is a rocket guy from Russia. So the person who took the picture, it was a Fink Miner. And uh, this, I wouldn't say it went viral, but it was <laughs> certainly used uh, heavily. Uh, this was at the uh, Planck launch. That's Puget, the PI of the high frequency instrument. My good friend George Estafio and uh, Francois Boucher. Uh, there we go, Puget, uh, Estafio, Martin Rees, Karlstrom. Uh, and okay, anyway, so in this subject, I would say I am friends with this group and a much more extended group. In other words, it really has been a tremendous experience being in the subject from the personal point of view as well as uh, what's happened. Okay, this um, is something that you're all so familiar with. There's no sense in me going through you know, Atacama, good place to go. I have been there. I had the anti-poly effect in the sense that I actually got there and instruments started to work as opposed to not work. <laughs> so I should be invited down again. That's why you're here. <laughs> uh, and of course, I put a big block around Simon's Observatory, which ultimately will, or may, evolve into CMB Stage 4. Tremendous excitement about what Simon's Observatory can accomplish relative to what's been done to date. Here's Spider. Uh, that was its, uh, we got the data at the beginning of 2015. We're still analyzing, it's ridiculous. Uh, but it, everything takes a long time, as you know. This is uh, my favorite picture because this is the uh, ACT site, which is uh, 5170 meters and uh, therefore it's somewhat cold. So I have a 
a winter jacket over here, which I put across to show how hardy we Canadians are. Uh, these are the kind of panels on the ACT uh, telescope. Anyway, happy days. Uh, beautiful picture. And then I don't have to go over with this group why you choose Atacama. Uh, it's dry. Uh, there are those who will say, how can you not be South Pole because water vapor sublimates out, uh, but you see more of the sky that's useful from Atacama. Uh, the CMB is still manageable, but barely. <laughs> So the uh, collaborations are really large now, and you probably all feel it, right? How do I fit in to something that's such a major enterprise? And it's not so easy. One thing I think that's important is you do your great contribution, but you keep your eye on the big subject, the big questions, what we're trying to solve as a group. Because it is, it's a family group which is going to deliver amazing results for humanity. You can see I'm giving you a pep talk here. And that's even before the beer. Uh, Planck was a big collaboration, so I've had quite a bit of experience in, in uh, people management, if you like. Uh, okay, so this is just, you know, your basic... Res improvements, Planck compared to WMAP compared to Kobe. Um, couldn't resist a, a spider map, uh, which is about the same res that Lightbird will have, which will be 12 bands, supposedly. Things may change. Uh, act what this does for you, but I'll show you that in a second. And then SO's huge step up. S4, 10 times the number of detectors. It's totally amazing, really. Okay, so um, there's a line here. On one side of the line is act plus plank. On the other side of the line is pure plank. A lot of this kind of speckly stuff is noise. Notice how point sources come up once you get to the 1.4 minute resolution. So this is the most recent version of this map. Uh, that was done by uh, Sigurd Nice, who's a really smart guy, and I uh, act an SO collaboration. And it's just kind of brilliant how all of this materializes. These ones are uh, point sources. Uh, every now and again, a cluster comes up. Uh, anyway, it's just a reminder that high res is a good thing. And plant was designed, and when we were first putting it out, the idea was that we would saturate all of the information with its five to seven arc minute beams. And that was fantasy because of all of the foregrounds that you had to marginalize over, all of the, uh, in particular the uh, extragalactic backgrounds. Okay, this is uh, the same thing in polarization where Planck looks a lot noisier and uh, and things look a lot better with, uh, uh, with advanced act and so one of these days actually maybe not even too far downstream you'll be seeing the new advanced act uh, results okay so you've seen all of these kinds of things you know the simplicity thing the this is the intensity map uh, polarization map with the polarization vector showing the TE, if you have eyes to see it, the TE correlation. How do you explain this to the general audience? I don't know how you're doing it, Brian, but I uh, have, there are people in the audience out at you through the screen. This is a military grade polarization set of uh, uh, polarized glasses. So by some combination of these, what you're supposed to do is to take a general audience and have them say, oh yeah, polarization, because it's not so easy to explain. It was not so easy to explain when we first found it with the CMB, and it's still not so easy to explain, right? So anyway, this was my stupid little way. Uh, one of the great accomplishments, of course, is CMB lensing. 
uh, 40 sigma detection with Planck, but it's uh, seen in so many different uh, experiments and seen beautifully, and that's, of course, going to be even more impressive over time. Right, so then you ask yourself, how are you going to explain CMB power spectra to a general audience? And the way I like to do it is to see if they have a visceral response to uh, these sort of harmonic analyses that if you've got music up, you see the uh, uh, power bands in the music coming up. And I like this a lot because you know all about the baryon acoustical oscillations. But I was trying to figure at four in the morning before my public talk at uh, Penn State, how am I going to try and do this so I could have as few words as possible to try and explain it? And so what I did is I did a harmonic sample of, uh, I this was my target, Beethoven, but uh, Le Vion Rose by Edith Piaf. You probably have it now ringing through your minds. Everybody knows the song. It's got its acoustic peaks. Uh, you know, she was considered to be the great Parisian songstress and so had wonderful overtones. Anyway, that was one way of explaining it. But this was what I was trying to get across mainly. The folklore is that the great classical musicians uh, took all of the octaves that the ear, that, that the ear could uh, hear and populated equally with power. So that's called 1 over F noise, uh, each band having equal power. And what I was delighted by, I just took this quick snapshot at the climax to the Ode to Joy, which is the Ninth Symphony. And again, it's probably all ringing through your heads because everybody knows it, right? And I was so delighted because it had a, a bit of a uh, slope to it. So I could explain without explaining the concept of the fundamental issues with the early universe, which is basically scale invariant flat, tilted a bit, and then the issue you have to, and by the way, it does involve sound phonons in the early universe, so it isn't so silly. Um, and uh, uh, then the thing that you have to do is to explain will the early universe sound like Beethoven's Ode to Joy? And the answer is, of course, no. Why is that? It's because it's phase incoherent. And, uh, and Ode to Joy is definitely phase coherent. OK, anyway, that was my, that was my little attempt, right? Um, oh, yeah, hey. Do I have the sound? Uh, yeah, there it is. You've, I'm sure you've heard this before, right? You take this, you uh, push it into audio frequencies, and you play it, and it sounds like, I think it sounds like the machine. <laughs> it's the machine that's running the universe, right? But somebody at the end of this Penn State thing came up to me, and she said, sounds like a heartbeat. I like that better. The heartbeat of the universe is what we're we're going after, right? Anyway, uh, that's good enough that it's worthwhile to hear it again. See, phase incoherence is not so melodious. <laughs> okay, well, I um, don't really want to go through this. I actually got chastised about this uh, by a little note from somebody who said, there are no women in this picture. So these are people who are CMB theorists from an historical period, you know, good friends. One of the reasons I like to show it is because I have before and afters for Sinyaev. Uh, this is the young Sinyaev. This is the great Zeldovich. Uh, this is Silk. Peebles. I gave him a little caption because he was the one who basically uh, more or less reintroduced Lambda for us all. Uh, not that uh, there wasn't Abbe Lemaitre who was absolutely brilliant back in the 30s, but uh, he basically was saying 
his reading of the um, data for large-scale structure was such that there was no way that omega and matter could be one. You need something else. He fooled around with the open universe idea, but came back to lambda. And uh, I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Not only that, with Ratcha, he put a T on it to deal with dynamical dark energy or quintessence. Um, there was a time where we didn't have a good idea, we still don't, about what the nature of the dark matter is. It's ridiculous. I'll bring your very eyes. Um, and that's my good friend George Stapio, who doesn't look that much different. And this is uh, Martin Rees uh, carved in stone. Um, I, I just happened to be staying at a Martin Rees, uh, uh, sorry, at, at a place in Cambridge for an extended period. Somebody there was a sculptress and made a sculpture of Martin Rees. Imagine my surprise. I thought, hey, that's Martin. Took a picture. That was, anyway, that's that story. Uh, so the story is. Uh, that in that period, we more or less had the cold dark matter basis, and we were actively thinking about the X in front of it and what it could be. And um, Lambda was without a doubt on the table. In fact, my view is that the standard model of cosmology from about 93 or 92 was the Lambda CDM model. That's what we were all running. Not everybody. Carlos Frank was the last holdout. But <clears throat> um, so the concept that all of our minds got blown away by the supernova results is not actually an accurate description of what happened. Uh, Lambda was, for the theorists, in spite of its silliness, um, theoretically, uh, was definitely on the table. OK. I mentioned the delta T over T meeting, so I won't spend any time on this, except I'm going to just point to the things that we're talking about then. Well, we had radio results, but secondary fluctuations via the Sinai Zeldovich effect, this is 87, primeval dust emission, CIB, heavily on the table. Uh, which universes can we rule out? That's still the game we play. Reheating issue. Future detectors, that's a story that's still with us. CMB statistics, polarization, future experiments at one degree. We were trying to sell the community on one degree because that's where the signal was supposed to be maximized. So that the discovery was the Kobe large scale structure one and FERS, etc. That was only more or less by chance. And then almost immediately after, the one degree thing started to come in because they had such a a large uh, amount. Um, Kobe, that was still in the future. Uh, angular power spectra for, for the uh, Sachs-Wolf effect. Good friend Artie. Miss him. Uh, delta T over T from gravitational waves. Ice curvatures. Open universes. String story. So there's a lot that was being discussed on the table, and uh, so much happened since then. This is a snapshot of what we were thinking about in uh, inflation at the time, which I'm going to skip over. This is the way I used to present this stuff in terms of seven pillars that we were looking for. This was an old, um, but I think good, calculation by Stathio in there. But it was a Sachs-Wolf effect. That was the first thing, of course, that Kobe found in FERS. Uh, first acoustic peak, the higher acoustic peaks, um, the damping tail. So sequentially, one experiment after another, each one individually was coming up with these results. And that picture emerged from the homo inhomogeneous joining of these many experiments together. And we really did well by that joining. And one of the reasons for that, again, this is something good for the audience here, uh, is that the microwave background really didn't make any missteps. If something was said by an experimental group, then you could basically count on it. I mean, there 
has been a glitch in the not uh, in, the, in the fairly recent past, but it was amazing that there was, and there were even a few outliers that had to be there statistically, and they were reported. BAM was an example. It was a British Columbia experiment, and it's just you know you throw the dice. That's luck of the draw. Um, okay, that polarization. You see, I have my thing. So everything came out perfectly. Uh, the uh, nonlinear Compton Sinazotovich, uh, Gaussianity of, this, of the fluctuations, and then the one that we haven't seen, which is pillar seven, is the gravity waves. So this is a current snapshot. Uh, this particular picture is from our Planck 2018 results overview paper showing uh, many of the experiments that some of you will have been involved in. Uh, I don't know why they chose yellow for polar bear, which tries to make it obscure. It's not a very good choice. If I could have done an enhancement for this talk, I would have. Um, but anyway, you can see the amazing development here. And this is gravitational lensing. Look at that. Um, this is where we came from. This is a snapshot. Uh, in my Lesouche lectures of the different heterogeneous results which showed that we actually did have uh, some semblance of a first peak. And this is before Boomerang, which really shaped it out very accurately. So we could draw inferences that were pretty strong from those days. And in fact, of course I did, because I'm a theorist. <laughs> And so this was a snapshot of sort of the uh, 97 kind of era of my conclusions. NS is 1 plus or minus 0.05. You needed large scale structure to help with this. CMB plus large scale structure showed that open models were very much less likely than lambda CDM models. And that the lambda you needed was about 2 thirds. Um, and so everything kind of fit in place. And this was in place before the supernova announcement. That is to say, we had a pretty good idea. And so, you know, I'm not taking away anything from the great supernova results. It's just that the whole thing was moving forward and we understood what was going on. These are the current values from Planck 2018. NS is 8.8 .8 sigma from unity. So that's our, um, our uh, Beethoven ninth uh, NS. And uh, that, of course, is one of the amazing results. And omega lambda is here. Anyway, so I have been living with NSs and omega lambdas that are about the values you're dealing with now for a very long time. So it's like they're ingrained. OK, I was going to have some fun with this, but I'm going to skip over it. Um, yeah, I'll skip over that. OK, um, yeah, uh, because we have beer to have, don't we? Um, introduced alpha, I introduced inhomogeneous alpha. I introduced trace of alpha. And intimately related to trace of alpha is this Superman figure. It's actually called Zeta. Uh, but nobody knows what Zeta is except for Bardeen and me and a few others. And some people misuse it. It's one of the great things that was developed. And one of the things we've been interested in is uh, what is its nonlinear generalization. So it took that story somewhat forward with a former graduate student of mine, uh, uh, Dave Salopak, but I would say the key movement forward was with Jonathan there, where we understood that it's a field path. But the key thing is that if you ha are on a uniform density surface, it's just this trace of alpha, which means that it's the strain. So it's measuring the isotropic strain of the universe. And those two things together, show that energy density and gravity are entangled. So if quantum mechanics is operating on energy density, which it must, then it must operate on gravity. 
So the people that said, oh, because of Bicep Keck claiming the discovery of gravity waves, therefore we have discovered quantum mechanics and the universe. That's not correct. It was already there just by the discovery and the necessity of entanglement of energy density and gravity. Uh, the reason this is such a fantastic quantity, it's an adiabatic invariant. And so all of the fields in the universe, it turns out to be the emergent property from inflation. And all of the fields get their values in response to this. Photons, neutrinos, dark matter, baryons, gluons, etc. They all have as their underlying element this trace of alpha. And that's pretty if remarkable. If you were quantizing gravity, why wouldn't I would naively expect an H bar, your favorite symbol of the day, to appear in that? Does it? Is it embedded? Is it absorbed? So um, the quanta of the energy density, just like in the room, are phonons. Phonons involve H bar. And then because this is entangled with it, that involves H bar. So, um, and the key point is though, the H bar, actually I was going to do a little diatribe on this, but I don't think I will. Um, H bar uncertainty principle. Not quite. I am going to do this. <laughs> I am going to do this, just because yes. it's fun, and I, uh, this was the one I wanted the reaction to these guys, right? So. Um, I like to think of this sequence, elasticity, stress is uh, uh, elastic moduli convolved with strain, except that you're in the DC limits, so they're constant. This is the usual Young's modulus stuff that you're all used to, right? Uh, viscosity, it's the strain rate that stress is responsible. Again, moduli. What's gravity? It is stress, uh, proportional strain acceleration. So what's the modulus? The modulus is 1 over 8 pi gn. It is 1 over L Planck squared. There is a bulk acceleration modulus. And what does that tell you? At least to me, it says it's a fantasy to think that Einstein's theory can be correct at high really high energies because this is just a constitutive relation that will break down at some point, just like these break down once you get to interatomic scales. So that's why I wanted to bug them about it because uh, they may have different, well, probably totally have different views. The other weirdness, Again, so you can see, I don't know if this is because I'm in my dotage or not, but I do love to think of these things. Yeah? So, so this looks like, um, I don't know, the, the other slide you just showed. Well, it's actually on this slide. Well, the other one where you integrate over what looks oh, okay. like, yeah. like kind of a, a fractional entropy history. In yeah, that's, it, it's, it, it's exactly an entropy quantity. Adiabatic invariant. So, Key. So if I, yeah, it looks very nice that way. So if you have, I just kind of like that the symmetry. If I, if I just say h bar is zero, and I have a completely homogeneous and isotropic manifold, <clears throat> yeah, you don't what get happens it. that quantity? You don't get it. it. Um, I mean, what's, what's interesting is that zeta is actually operative with cold dark matter as well. It's the conserved quantity before shell crossing and, and halo production. So you can use it at late times as well. So um, no, no fluctuations and it goes away. Well, no. He, yeah. So here is the remarkable thing. Um, if you don't have quantum fluctuations adding to the condensate, the inflaton condensate, then it's a conserved quantity, adiabatic invariant, entropy. And so the story, at least the way I like to express it, of the creation and structure of the universe is not fundamentally, I mean, it's related, but not fundamentally a density story or a strain story. It is the combination story, which means that it's an entropy story. 
and how the entropy is entering, because as you know, sometimes entropy can be quite a misleading thing, because um, typically it involves coarse graining. And here, our fundamental coarse graining is the scale of the Hubble parameter, H inverse. And so the coarse grain are the waves of scale that are long compared to H inverse. And the fluctuations are the waves that are short. And there is a communication across the boundary. It's basically like Hawking radiation. And so um, you end up, and so the stuff that flows across joins into the condensate. And this is the thing which maybe everybody recognizes, but I thought it was a bit of an insight. It's actually the genes instability. So the waves that are coming across, they're freezing out, they're building the condensate. It's because they are experiencing an effect of genes instability. So you know how the genes instability works, right? You have sound, and then you have unstable sound, which is gravity overcoming the sound speed squared times k squared. It makes that's another story, but it's a story that I quite like, which is that the boundary between the two are condensates, bosons and condensates. So I'll, I'll, I will give you this statement just to maybe over beers we can talk about it. So a star is a Bose-Einstein condensate. A halo is a Bose-Einstein condensate. They are everywhere. And they're usually associated with an instability and then they find a new equilibrium. And that equilibrium often has some binding energy associated with them. A halo has binding energy. Stars have binding energy. You think, oh, come on, star's hot. Yeah, but it's because it's not Bose-Einstein condensate in the atomic <coughs> sense. It's Bose-Einstein condensate in the gravity sense because it's a different force, which is long range. Anyway, that's just a little something to trip your minds on. You see, this is supposed to be a public kind of presentation, but I do like to do a little bit of uh, synaptic gap. Uh, OK. Right, so this is uh, some of my favorite figures uh, from what we did with Planck. Actually, this is Planck 2018, so this is not in the Planck papers. Uh, it's not even going to go in. I think maybe Shiji and I, who I work with pretty heavily on this, uh, uh, might do something. Uh, uh, so this is the mean value of this Superman quantity zeta, subject to constraint of everything that we've got from Planck temperature and polarization. It's like a Wiener filtered map of the ultra-early universe. And so you see all of the kinds of structure. And if I went back to the intensity map, you'd say, well, there's some similarity. But what actually has happened is that the oscillations, the baryon acoustic oscillations, are in effect have been taken out because it's trying to do the early universe data and not the one with the baryon acoustic oscillations. So that's what the mean field's trying to do. The trouble with mean fields, and any time you've ever seen a Wiener filtered map, you should put up your hand and ask a question. What are the fluctuations like? Because they can be misleading because there can be regions where there's no data, where everything looks like it's zero. But in fact, that's not saying it's zero. It means that if you add the fluctuations, you get all of these big fluctuations there. So, that's just an aside. So this is just, what, what I'm going to show now is just an example of what happens when you add the fluctuations. And you can see that it does do things. And if I did another roll of the dice for the fluctuations, they'd be somewhat different. But the basic thing is that some of these structures are just there. And so the concept of what we're doing is we're using microwave background data to peer into the first 10 to the minus, I don't know, 43 seconds or whatever, right? I mean, that's an amazing concept. And this is, in my view, what our big target is in many respects in terms of what we're trying to do with all these experiments. We're trying to do these reconstructions, ultra early universe, late universe, the best we can. OK, did that. Uh, OK, lots. there are some anomalies. This is the cold spot. It turns out to be a zeta 
bump in, uh, in the zeta thing. It's like a little bump in scale size. Uh, it's not very big, but in terms of its anomaly, it's 4.5 sigma. Okay, so this is what I'll end on, which is um, uh, Beethoven's ninth, except uh, as expressed by Mother Nature in the early universe. This is the reconstruction of the power spectrum. It's better in some respects than the maps that I showed because it's able to simultaneously, it's done with the quadratic likelihood um, from Planck, and so it's simultaneously taking into account delensing and all of that to try and do the spectrum, whereas you can't really do that in any good way here, so you have to treat it as a little bit of extra noise. Uh, if we had been on the mark, all of our analyses of uh, non-Gaussianity in Planck would have been done with these Wiener filtered maps and the fluctuations. That was the goal. Then uh, the computational cost became too big and the results that one was getting without being optimal, which is what this is, uh, just uh, we decided it wasn't necessary and that same thing holds in the 2018, which you haven't seen yet. I'm putting this on Okay, so, but first of all, I should say why you should be incredibly excited about this picture. These are bands in K space, wave number. So it means that what we've done is we've broken the spectrum up into all sorts of bands, just like you do with CL, where you, you know, you put these band powers on it. And over a very large range, before the data sort of runs out, and then something happens up here, even with all of those degrees of freedom, it's a uniform NS. So it isn't that, oh, we fit NS. What we've done is to show that NS is brilliant, and that's quite amazing. Uh, then there is a little anomaly associated with the L band of 20 to 30. I'm sure you heard about it. It's only about two sigma, so you don't take it too seriously. Uh, but it's been with us at some level. It's improved now with the data we have with Planck. But it's basically been with us from WMAP, for sure. Uh, Kobe didn't do so well in this region because its uh, beam was... Uh, uh, seven degrees, but um, this now includes uh, TE and EE, well, TE and EE information in it, and um, in fact, it's got all of the information in it, and so there is this uh, little anomaly, and what will happen is when uh, S4 happens, you'll see this anomaly, and it'll be essentially the same. When light bird happens, you'll see this anomaly, it'll essentially be the same. There's no indication it's going to go away. It's there. We haven't been able to actually see it as some kind of spotty thing on the sky. We did some searching for it. But, you know, it's going to be with us, right? You're going to have to live with it. And it's got a slight impact on the gravity waves, but not really a big one. This is with uh, Bicep Keck 2015. Uh, this is the two sigma limit, one sigma limit. Uh, you can't give gravity waves the number of degrees of freedom that we've given the zeta spectrum. It's just not feasible. So uh, it's only been given uh, essentially one degree of freedom, which is amplitude. So uh, just as a point, this is uh, an m squared phi squared theory, and this is the data. And what I am really uh, impressed by, if I do say so, is that when we use the 12 bands, our limit on R is 0.069 uh, at the 95% confidence limit. If you force uniform NS, it's 0.061. In other words, it had these degrees of freedom. It could have 
and, and, and it turned out that with earlier versions of the data, this was not determined that well relative to this number. And now they're basically the same number. It's amazing. So um, anyway, as you know, this is where we are in terms of R. And uh, this is where we are in terms of NS. And uh, it looks like Beethoven. This is where we're going with the zeta spectrum with Simon's Observatory, which uh, shows that, well, I think the main point is that we get to penetrate to much higher K because of the higher res that we're going to get with Simon's. And uh, you can't really do that much when you're in the extreme cosmic variance limit uh, at, the, um, at the lower Ks. But, uh, you can see that there is a lot of improvement which is possible at the high levels and that's what we're going to be doing. Okay, these are the famous RNS plots. I'm not going to fool around with those. Uh, and so now I'll just take a step through things that, like an Uber statement. So uh, zeta, observable, all cosmic structure from it, that's the thing. Wherever I have an S, it involves entropy. Um, entropy is the cooled re remnant of particle field plasma post-inflation. Uh, it's all essentially stored in the CMB and the CNU B. The number within the horizon is 10 to the 88.6. I'm sure you had that emblazoned in your mind. It's a rather non-trivial number unless you compare it to the Gibbons-Hawking entropy associated with the H which is maybe 10 to the 122 or so, and uh, it's also um, uh, small compared to the entropy of the black holes in active galactic nuclei, which is just a statement of what is that other stuff. Uh, the baryon asymmetry, of course, we've been with that for a long time, 10 to the minus 10.06 relative to the entropy. Uh, dark matter, who knows, really small errors. Uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis influenced by the CC, this is for your benefit, influenced by the CNU B in weak physics, which is what we're on about. CMB, of course, was the major topic here. Uh, huge amount of information coming in from galaxies, large scale clustering, flows, gravitational lensing. The extra ingredient we get is the tomography with redshift in many different ways. And then uh, uh, dark energy, and if we were wanting a wish list for Mother Nature, it would be one, let the dark energy be dynamical, so there's more than just lambda to measure. Two, let it be coupled so that we can actually get information about it on relative scales. But Mother Nature may not follow, certainly doesn't seem to ever follow my dictums. Okay, so this was just things that we haven't seen yet, and there are lots of things. And this is the, uh, <laughs> uh, this is the executive summary, uh, and where we're supposed to go with R, less than 0.06 now, two sigma, that's 95% confidence, for Simons we're touting 0.006 as our target, Stage four to sigma 0 0.001, Lightbird claiming 0 0.002, and we all know that uh, the dust may be much more complex than we think, and so really digging down might actually be a hassle. Uh, the generic comment highly uh, uh, resonating here is that the combination of CMB and LSS is a Future Fundamental Physics Laboratory, and um, I, I appended dollar to DOE. <laughs> That's probably more hopeful than, okay, and end of bonds time. <laughs> Yeah, so we brought in a lot of Molson, Golden, and Labatt's for you, Labatt's, however you say it. Um, so we don't want to take too much time, but we have questions for people, for Dick. Any questions for Dick? So you, you did talk about break the ice, the ice cold beer. So you talked a lot about the Planck time, but 